thanking Melissa. She actually said something a little different to me earlier. She said that that was very kind of her not to tell you what she said. But she said, you spoke to my kids' class. It was really great because you spoke to their level. <laughs> and I said, you know, that wasn't an act. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Vermont Law School. Vermont Law School. Dean Mahali, to the entire faculty, board of trustees, Cheryl Hanna, thanks for your great work, to the entire team. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for being Vermont Law School. To all the people that are about to graduate, congratulations from me. Uh, we're very proud of you. And Tom Steyer just asked me, are these all people that are about to graduate? <laughs> and uh, by the way, I know you did it the old fashioned way, not the way Tom is doing it. Uh, you know, you actually, it's work. But, uh, anyway, I said, no, Tom, actually, this is Vermont. Uh, and there are a lot of Vermonters here because you're the kind of person that Vermonters have a lot of respect for. So, welcome, Vermonters. Welcome, law school team. This school makes me so proud. Uh, as you know, uh, this is Vermont's law school. And I just got to tell you, as a governor, as we confront the challenges that we're facing, uh, knowing that we have to get off of oil and move to other ways of power in the future for the sake of our kids and our grandkids and the livability of the planet. We always say the livability of the planet, but we all know that, in fact, the planet's going to be just fine. It's the rest of us that are in big trouble. Uh, that if we can't move faster than we're currently moving, if we can't immediately get off of our addiction to oil and find other ways of powering the future. We're not going to have a planet to pass in livable form to our kids and our grandkids. And when I think about what we're doing with Vermont in partnership with Vermont Law School, putting lawyers out there who are leading the grassroots fights across this country to try to get folks to get it, to move on to more job creating and sustainable ways of power in the future, of joint energy efficiency. It makes me proud to be the governor that gets to have Vermont Law School. When you look at the kinds of things like the bill I signed last week, the first in the nation, uh, to make it possible for Americans to know, Vermonters to know in this case, you know what's in their food by saying, if you've grown it, if you're using GMOs, we want consumers to be able to know. It was the knowledge from this law school that gave us the ability to write the legislation that gives us the best shot at winning that one in court against the big multinational food companies. They're going to try to take us down. So whether it's climate, energy, efficiency, food, all the areas where you're helping us, this school is an extraordinary asset, not only in the state of Vermont, but to all of the good work that we're trying to do more quickly to ensure that we leave a better and cleaner planet. And the part that I'd like to talk about, about our mission, I'm going to be brief because I know that Tom's going to get a degree and he's going to uh, uh, do a lot of the smart talking with. Uh, but the part that I think we should be bragging about more is the fact that as Vermont moves, as an example of the 50 states, by 2050 to 90 percent renewable, as we harness the wind and the sun and our forests and our streams through biomass, uh, and obviously, you know, our wells uh, through Cool, cool, cold climate heat pumps, as I call them. As we do all of the above, we're creating jobs and economic opportunity. Today it was announced uh, that Vermont's unemployment rate went down another notch. We're down uh, literally to 3.3%. We now have the second lowest unemployment rate in America. And the only state that's beating us is beating us since happens to be North Dakota because they're harnessing and drilling for things that we know are not sustainable. So as soon as they figure that out, you know, Vermont will be number one. <laughs> so all I'm saying is we've got a great story to tell. The resource behind it is this great Vermont Law School. The graduates that will graduate tomorrow who will all fan out across America and across the planet to help us grow a more sustainable and job-creating future with renewables and energy efficiency as we move off the sins of the past and move to a greener, cleaner planet. So thank you, Vermont Law, for making this possible. I'm also really thrilled that you picked Tom Steyer uh, to give an honorary degree to. Uh, I've known Tom since he was nine or 10 years old. Uh, we went to summer camp together. Uh, Tom and his brother Jim was in my tent. As you can tell from Tom's 
you know, let's be honest about this, is Robert Redford looking good looks. <laughs> uh, he's a lot younger than I am. But we were only a couple years apart in camp because I was slow. <laughs> and uh, we had some great times together that I won't tell you about in front of the cameras. All I can tell you is that from a young kid and everywhere else powered into the future, Tom Steyer has been a person who's had the courage to stand by his convictions, who has the ability to take ideas that are critical and help make them big, and who has dedicated his life not to the pursuit of more capital, but to saying, you know, there are bigger things that we should all be doing. And I'm going to lead by example, by trying and doing everything in my power to ensure that we are bolder, that we move more quickly, that we take convince more people across America and more politicians who are making decisions that our time is limited, our window is closing, and our time is now. So Tom's dad was a lawyer. His two brothers are lawyers. None of us ever thought he'd be a lawyer. <laughs> but I've got to say, congratulations, Vermont Law, for choosing such a deserving honorary degree for such a deserving person that I believe when all of this, when we look, when our kids look back on this chapter in world history, we'll say there were a few people out there who had the willingness to stop what they were doing and listen and look at what's happening around them. Forests that are dying, environmental quality that's going down, people that know that the storms like Irene that we've seen across Vermont are not a hundred year storm anymore. I've managed three of them since I've been governor. Other governors are doing the same thing. They even hit Republican governors. Try Sandy. <laughs> that we're all in this together and that we've got to find faster, more creative ways to move quickly and create jobs and prosperity while we do it. So thank you to Vermont Law and thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you for your kind words about Vermont Law School and for your service to Vermont and your continuing support uh, to this institution. Um, I'm Mark Mahali. I'm the president and dean of the law school. Um, we're going to present a degree to Tom Steyer. Uh, ordinarily, we would do this tomorrow, but we're going to enact the ritual that we would do tomorrow now. Uh, but I just want to say before I read the formal words and ask Ed Mattis, the chair of our board, to join me um, that, Tom, welcome to Vermont. Welcome to a law school that is unlike any other law school. This law school is a place for, it is not a place for people who just want to live in and manage the status quo. This is a law school for people who want to change the status quo. And that is why we invited you. That's why we're giving you a degree. That's why you're an inspiration to our students. So, Tom, would you come up? Ed, would you come up? Now, you know, most of the people we give degrees, they don't know where to stand or how to do it. So you stand right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, OK. The, the, the stuff is over here. So ordinarily, he would be wearing a robe. Uh, and I would say, as I'm going to say now, Thomas F. Steyer, you have been a true trailblazer in your leadership of clean energy and climate change policy. You created a bipartisan coalition to defeat California's Proposition 23, an effort by out-of-state oil companies to dismantle California's groundbreaking clean energy law. Your influence extends beyond California. Your establishment of advanced energy economy and next generation has worked with businesses to make energy secure, clean, and affordable. You are working politically to avert climate disaster and preserve American prosperity. You have worked tirelessly to promote environmental protection and advance renewable energy. Your vision of and dedication to a clean energy future have made you a remarkable and inspiring advocate. 
Therefore, lawyers say therefore, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Trustees of Vermont Law School, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws honoris causa, and I welcome you to all of the honors, privileges, and obligations pertaining thereto. So I want to say um, thank you very much for having me here today, and it is true, as Peter Shumlin said, that my family would finally accept me as a full member at this point. Um, my name is Tom Steyer. I am very happy to be here. Vermont actually is extraordinary in terms of its dedication to advanced energy ideas, to the leadership that's coming from this state is actually vastly disproportionate to the number of people who live here. It's inspirational. Um, amazingly enough, after Irene, I was reading in the paper the governor's statements, and I hadn't seen Peter for a long time, and I was thinking, this is exactly what I think. Who is this guy? And it wasn't until I read it, I was like, Peter Shum? I don't think so. <laughs> and I really, I called up my brother, and I was like, did Peter end up in Vermont? <laughs> So, uh, Peter is just one example, though, honestly, of the kind of leadership that's come out of Vermont. I think Pat Leahy has said some things that I absolutely agree with that I think are, he said, climate change represents one of the greatest challenges of our time, but is also uniquely suited to our strengths as a country. I think that is right down the heart of America. That is exactly what I believe, that not only is it this huge challenge for us, but it's an opportunity for us to do exactly what we're very good at. I think Peter Welch is really a great representative for the state of Vermont. And I think that the Vermont Law School, who I've been sitting around having lunch with today, is really amazing. The people who've chosen to come here, not just the people who grew up here, but the people who chose to come here from different parts of the country, from environmental leadership from different parts of the country, is really unusual and amazing, and I applaud everyone who's done it. So I am actually very pleased and honored to be here. Let me say this, I don't think it's at all unusual in the history of the United States to have one issue be the issue that defines a generation. I'm, you know, I'm born in 1957, for my parents' generation it was World War II, for my grandparents' generation it was World War I. And I think if you go back to American history you will see that even though there are lots of issues all the time, as I like to say, do you remember if your family was here where they stood on the great tariff debate of 1873? No one knows if there was a great tariff debate in 1873, <laughs> including me. I'm just messing with them. <laughs> but the same will be said about the budget debates of 2009, 2010, 2011. No one will care in 50 years. There will be one issue that will really define us. Now the question how did I come on this? You know, I basically am the, on the board of Stanford University and I've been on there for about seven or eight years at this point. So when I went on the board, I asked myself, what can a great university do to distinguish itself, to improve our society, to use their resources in terms of technology research, policy, and business acumen there, but I went to Stanford Business School, to really make a difference in the world. So it really forced me to think, what are the things that are confronting us as a society and how can we respond to them? And after spending a lot of time thinking about it and trying to really put myself in the position of Stanford, but also as a citizen of the United States, I decided it was climate. And we funded all those things, technology research, 
financial research in terms of energy, legal research in terms of energy. If you will notice, just to say, last week Stanford decided they would divest from coal. And, and they did it based on statements that they drew up in 1971. And the only thing that I asked in that whole debate was, when we come to serious questions of that, you know, and I think this is absolutely true in life, when you get to a tough question, when you're really facing something and you don't know the right framework to think about it in, you really have to go to what your mission is. You have to go back to what is the deepest thing that you represent that you're trying to accomplish. So the one thing I ask Stanford University as a board member to do is, let's look at this from the point of view of a great educational institution that has very high ideals that we should live up to. And the tougher the question, the more we should go to our mission. And we should, but however we come out, it's not a question of how you come out, it's where you're coming from. And that's really the point that I would make is, when you have to make these hard decisions, you really have to go back to the very basis of what your most, your deepest values are and come from there. And that's why I was actually very proud that Stanford came out where they did. And I was very proud today to see that the governor of California said maybe the UC system should follow Stanford's lead on it. <laughs> but let me say this, even though I thought Stanford was poised to make a lot of research gains and that there was lots of good things going on around the country, I didn't think it was enough. I thought there was a log jam on energy and climate. That the, basically, my, I'm convinced the American system works really well. We have problems, people yell and scream, they argue with each other, we come up with answers, and they basically get solved. We have a really good system that has worked really well for centuries. And the question I had was, why isn't this working here? And the answer to me, pure and simple, it's politics. And that one idea, that one insight, is really what's driven me since then. It really has made me change my life. I mean, I partly got to know it by getting involved in the props that Martin, the propositions on the California ballot that Mark was referring to. We had a, a proposition in 2010, no on 23, which was defending the existing energy laws in California. And then we ran one in 2012, which had to do with retrofitting schools for energy so that basically we could save money so the money in the schools could go to the kids. We could have a, a smaller carbon footprint. We could put a bunch of people to work. There were, it was a, the kind of thing where I said to everybody, we, we did it through closing a loophole on out-of-state corporations who got a deal that no in-state corporation was getting. I, and I said, and I honestly believe, this should be 100 to zero in terms of voting. There's no Californian who should vote against this. So I got a chance to see what kind of coalitions, who will step up, who doesn't like it. We obviously didn't get 100% of the votes, and that, which of course surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, who's gonna be on our side? How do we make sure business is on our side? It gave me a chance to get into the nuts and bolts of human beings talking to each other in the United States about energy and climate, what they care about, what they profess to care about but don't, and how to really conduct a campaign. So I left my job, I've been a professional investor for 30 years. I left my job at the, in 2012 to found something called Next Gen Climate. And once again, I decided, in the private sector, your bottom line is your bottom line. In a nonprofit, you really have to ask yourself, what is your mission? It's really worth spending the time on that question. Partly for the reason that I said that when it's a tough, when you have a tough, situation, you want to be able to go back to your mission and make sure you're true to it, but also because it's a great way to say no to people. You know, when someone comes and says we need playgrounds in San Francisco, which we do, you can say, actually, can I read you my mission statement? And I'll read you our mission statement, which Mark referred to, is to act politically, to prevent climate disaster, and preserve American prosperity. And that may seem like total mom and apple pie. But the fact is there are a couple things in there that are unusual. One is the <laughs> politically point. Most of the people who are working on energy and climate are either working on science or policy. We're working specifically to try and change the political landscape. 
Secondly, preserving American prosperity. We're really serious about that we can do this in a way that makes Americans better off, that makes them better employed, that basically, if we, set the, if we win the politics and get the policies right, American business will do this in a creative, innovative way that will make us all better off. I mean, I spent 30 years of my life in the private sector watching this happen. I have a really deep belief that when the policies are right, American business can do things that blows everybody's mind. So let me give you some examples. You know, do you re even remember when the hole in the ozone layer or acid rain were supposed to be insolvable problems? We read the exact same things. It's not true. If it is true, we can't afford to solve them. If we could afford to solve them, it'll take forever. Really, there's nothing to do. The fact was, when we changed the policies, American business, some small, some very large American businesses, innovated faster, better, cheaper, so that by the time the solutions came around, people had forgotten the problem and assumed we would have done it without changing the policy. I mean, to give you just a, a brief insight into how much it can change, I'll give you two. One is, it used to be 25 cents to trade a share of stock on the New York Stock Exchange. They would trade several million shares a day at the best. It's now less than a penny. They deregulated it in the 70s. They trade over a billion shares a day. Change policies and the impact of what American business can do with new rules is incredible. So think, I, I'm from San Francisco, California. So I live right in the heart of Silicon Valley. They broke up Ma Bell in 1983. They deregulated the communications industry between 94 and 96. In 1983, my parents were living in New York. They had a rotary phone and a TV. They, since then, there have been 10,000 American innovations. The phone system that my parents were using would have been just fine with Alexander Graham Bell. They would not even understand the language that is used today in the communications that every kid going to Vermont Law School, and every kid younger than that thinks has always been there. The fact of the matter is when American business is challenged, when the rules change, they explode. And I, I think you can't show me the time it hasn't happened. You never know that there's gonna be an internet in 1983. Google was not always here. It really, I mean, the, the, our ability, what we will do in energy, we will never, we can't even imagine because the ideas haven't even come forward yet. So, so let me talk for a second about where the students of the best environmental law school in the country stand and what the purpose of an institution like this is. I mean, as in, in spite of my um, fancy degree, I'm not a lawyer. Um, <laughs> But I know that we live in a nation of laws and I've invested around the world. And I know there are relatively few nations on the earth that are truly under the rule of law. I know that through hard won experience. And as lawyers, the, making the imp, imp, implementing these rules gives you an enormous power for good. It gives you an amazing amount of power. The system has been around. People have been fighting for the system for hundreds of years. And when I see the impact of a thoroughly legal system, a system where the rule of law is completely accepted, understood, never really challenged, and then move around the world and see how it works in other ways, the value of this system, of the people who work in it, is really it's not even transformational. It's, complete, it's a completely different way of thinking about the world. So whether the graduates of this school work in public policy, whether they work in nonprofits, whether they work in the private sector, it really doesn't matter. This system itself and the people who work in it have essential power to American society. And so when I think about that, I know that at Vermont Law School they teach you a lot of things. I know that they fill your head with statutes and um, specific facts 
till it's crammed. And the fact is you're about, to, all the graduates are now gonna have to take the bar exam. So if they think their heads are crammed right now before graduation, they're gonna spend the next couple of months really filling their, fa their heads with facts. And my only point, the only thing I really wanna to say today is this, don't let your head get away from your heart. You know, when I think about people going into careers, the biggest thing you can do is trust yourself to succeed and not feel as if you have to do something different from who you really are in order to succeed. People here will succeed and they don't need to make that trade off. Even though, I view this as kind of a mission statement. When the times are tough, you really have to ask yourself, what are your deepest values? And be sure that sticking to those actually will work out. That there is no time when it's worth it to really make a compromise on that. And I would, there was a guy when I was growing up in New York, who was still pretty much of a baseball driven society. Football hadn't really taken over. And the best team, according to people from New York, was the New York Yankees. And the best player on the New York Yankees was Mickey Mantle. So Mickey Mantle grew up in Oklahoma, he grew up in Commerce, Oklahoma, which was a coal mining town. And every mantle for generations who was male had been a coal miner. And they'd gone down in the mines and breathed coal dust, and they all died before they were 40. So Mickey Mantle comes out of there, he plays for the New York Yankees, he's the best player, and he's also a real bum. He drinks his breakfast, he shows up hungover, you know, and he gets hurt a lot, and he just doesn't take care of himself. Because he thinks, I'm going to die before I'm 40, like every mantle male, so I might as well just have a good time while I'm hanging around. When he was 54 years old, Mickey Mantle said, if I'd known how long I was going to live, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> and actually, that's an incredibly important story. Because Mickey Mantle actually didn't respect how good he was. He didn't actually take himself and his life as seriously as he should have when he was a young person. He really took it all for granted and did, he didn't understand the impact he could have. He didn't give himself enough resonance. So when I think about this, that is really what I think young people need to remember. How important their, their lives are. How much impact they can have. The old people in this room, believe it or not, are like Mickey Mantle at 54. They're taking their lives seriously. They really want to have impact and, and they care about the, the ramifications of what they do. And I think the earlier you understand that, the more seriously you will take yourself and the more impact you will have and you will be truer to yourself. So let's talk for one sec. I'm gonna try and leave as much time as possible for questions, but let's talk about one second about modern environmental laws, which is basically, when I look at it, it's all from 1970. The laws based in the environmental laws at the federal level in the United States came from Earth Day. 20 million people showed up on Earth Day, and lo and behold, we passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and we created the EPA, all in a Republican administration. And if you look now, more than 40 years later, about how we're dealing with carbon dioxide emissions and pollution, we're dealing with it through those statutes. So the impact of law is incredibly long and incredibly powerful. In, in fact, our reinterpretation of those laws is dealing with problems that we didn't recognize at the time those laws were passed. So when I think about what we're doing now, the people who say that we're not able to deal with the problems, that we're basically at a standstill, that government is broken, I would say, for, at, first of all, for this reason, that's not true because we already have existing laws being implemented by people who are very serious about it, including a lot of people who went to Vermont Law School, that are still powerful, that are still relevant, that still deal in a significant way with our issue. And the second thing I'd say is this, we have a federalist system. When it comes to climate change, many of the states are doing really good things. Peter Shumlin is here. I was teasing earlier about reading about him in the New York Times, but the fact of the matter is, Vermont is part of Reggie. Peter is the head of the Democratic Governors Association. Vermont really stands for something and is acting very substantially on this. The states are leading. Peter is really good. He's not the only good governor in the United States when it comes to this. The closer you are to the people of the United States, 
the more likely you are to have to deal with the facts on the ground. And in Vermont, we are actually seeing great leadership. In California, we're trying to do a Reggie-like compact. We're trying to do it with British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. Reggie is actually a model for the United States. You know, we've seen this in American history, going right back to the Green Mountain Boys. When there are big issues, local people deal with the problems and get together. And then the people from different locales get together again. So if this were just an American issue, I would be very confident that between the laws on the books and the kind of initiative that's been taken in the states, plus the administration, I want to talk about in one second, we would be okay. But the fact of the matter is, it is not just an American issue. This is global, it's a global issue. It absolutely requires a global solution. And the problem with that is, as a nation, we don't just have to make the changes for ourselves. We have to lead the rest of the world. So we can't solve this locally and let everybody else do what they want around the world. We actually have to go out, use our technology, use our moral leadership, use our financial leadership, and make sure that it's, everyone else understands why it's in their interests. But let me give you one other po major positive. The Obama administration has been doing a great job on this for the last year. I think, I look around, since President Obama spoke at Georgetown, and they have made it a priority, they're looking at it as a legacy issue, they're doing hard things in spite of what they think it might mean for them politically, and I think that it's unfair to miss how, mu how hard they're working on this, what, how smartly they're thinking about this, and the impacts they can have. I really think President Obama and his administration have distinguished themselves on this for the last year, has, have done an absolutely flat A job, and I think when people do a really good job, it's too easy to criticize the president. It's too easy to talk about, you know, we really wish that he was getting climate legislation. In the, in the context of the place where he is, he is doing an absolutely outstanding job, and I want to make sure that he gets support for it, because I think it's not necessarily easy at all. But let me say one other thing. If you, if you guys have been reading the paper, there have been a series of studies over the last month that have been shockingly important. There was the study on the ice sheets melting that came out this week. There was the DOD national security impact study that came out this week. There was the climate change assessment that came out a couple of weeks ago. There were the economic studies. And I think the biggest significance of these studies, for the people in this room, none of those studies was probably new. You guys probably knew the facts, except for maybe the one on the uh, Antarctic ice sheets, which probably was new. But the rest of it was very convincing organizations saying things that probably people at the Vermont Law School already knew. <coughs> to me, the biggest significance of this spate of study was what I call the Sherlock Holmes effect. The clue was the dog was not barking. The dogs are not barking. We have not heard an intellectual or data-driven response to any of those studies. So when we sit here and think about this, it's really not about the science. You know, we're not hearing comeback on that. It's not about the policies. We're not hearing a policy discussion on this. What we're hearing is something much less thoughtful. I don't hate to be rude, but what we're seeing is, I mean, we're seeing a couple of weeks ago, the embrace of Clive and Bundy by Rand Paul. We're seeing an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal by Charles Koch, basically saying that government is the, opposition of, is the opposite of freedom. If you think about that in the context of the biggest government initiatives of our lifetime, of our parents' lifetime, going back to the founding of the Republic, that's an amazing statement. If you, Government is the opposite of freedom. Think about Lincoln, government of the people, by the people, for the people. The opposite of that, that's a strong statement. And Marco Rubio repeatedly asserted that climate change is not caused by humans without one citation to explain why he believes that he knows more than all the climate scientists. So, I do believe this is the big challenge for our generation. That's why we're bent on trying to affect the politics in the country. 
I am really happy to be in Vermont. I, there's one other great Vermont climate person who you, I'm sure you all know, Bill McKibben, who said, there's a tendency at every important but difficult crossroad to pretend it's not really there. That's exactly where we are. We're at the crossroad and there are people claiming that we're not, it's not there. So when we think about how to go forward, I really think my only message is do not separate your heart from your head. We will not win this unless people participate politically. We will not win un until elected officials believe that they have to do the right thing or they'll lose their job. As my good friend George Schultz likes to say, democracy is not a spectator sport. We actually, you can't just do your job. You have to be involved. We all have to be in involved politically. And my last quote will be Ronald Reagan. There are no easy answers, but there are simple answers. We must have the courage to do what we know is morally right. So I think that's just, I think President Reagan got it exactly right. We're not looking for easy answers or quick fixes, but there's a simple point here, which is that we actually have to solve this crisis. And the people in this room have the ability to make a huge difference here, both personally, professionally, and politically. And so I'm sure you will, I am very, impressed by the institution, I'm very impressed by the people in the institution, and I'm very impressed by Vermont. But I, the last thing I will say, and then I'll turn it over to questions, is this. When we were growing up, the statement in our family was, there's nothing so powerful, we were all boys, but I will make it co-ed, as a good man or woman who's in the right and just keeps coming on. That's what I believe is required here, and that is what I believe you will do. Thank you very much. So I think when you think about elections across the country, unfortunately as an investor, I think about them in a strange way, which is this. I think about them in two ways, but the first one is alpha and beta. So let me explain those two to you. When you're investing, the thing that moves the whole country, that makes the economy grow more or less, that makes interest rates go more or less, it has nothing to do with your specific investment, but, it, but affects all investments called beta. And the thing that matters just to your investment, like whether you have good leadership, whether your technology is good, whether you're good at customer relations, that's called alpha. So when we think about a campaign in choose your state, Louisiana, Colorado, Maine, Washington, you, you have to think about them in terms of alpha and beta. So the beta really is how popular, believe it or not, is the administration in Washington. That's the, that's the baseline for thinking about a state. So every state will be different on that question, but when you think about where someone, an election in Alabama, the first question will be, how does Alabama feel about the Obama administration? And then there's the alpha question, which is, okay, but who are the people running in Alabama, and how are they doing relative to each other and relative to the voters of Alabama? So the first question, so before you can know what's gonna happen in November, of 2014, you have to ask yourself, how's the president doing in November of 2014? And that's an unknowable. But that's gonna be your baseline. And then there's gonna be the alpha. But the second, so that's one point. Think about it in alpha beta terms. Now, of course, I think the president's gonna be kicking ass. But 
believe that to be true. <laughs> Second point is this. This is an off-year election. And off-year elections are completely different from presidential year elections because the turnout is completely different. So as an example, in Virginia, where there was a governor's race in 2013, the turnout in, in an off-year election in Virginia is slightly more than half the turnout in a presidential election, and the, the, what's called the drop-off is not proportionate between every part of the electorate. So traditionally, the less the poorer parts of the state vote less in off-year elections. I think that's the easiest way to describe it. But in addition, in Virginia, and I think this was extraordinary, but it makes the point, 98% of the Democrats voted for the Democrat. And 96% of the Republicans voted for the Republican. So when you think about the ability to persuade somebody from the other party to vote, I would think 2% could have voted for the other party by mistake. In fact, I'm pretty sure that's true. I'm sure 2% of the people punched the wrong hole. So when, you're, when you think about an off-year election and persuasion, it's really not about persuasion. It's about turnout. It's how many Republicans showed up to the poll because effectively they all voted for the Republican. And how many Democrats showed up because they all voted for the Democrat. That's actually a very powerful thing. I mean, one of the things that I had not understood when all the Republican vitriol about the Affordable Care Act, I thought they were trying to persuade people like me that this was a bad idea. And, you know, I wasn't that persuaded, to be honest. But it turns out, it was explained to me, they aren't even trying to do that. They're simply trying to encourage, inflame, excite the people who are already going to vote the way they think to turn out. So when you think about a 2014 election and Melissa's question, those are the three things that I would really focus on, which is what's the alpha, what's the beta, and mostly what's the turnout. Because that's actually where the rubber is going to meet the road. And that's an organizational question. That is also an emotional question. When people are upset, when they're angry, or when they feel they have something important to defend, they turn out and vote. And when they're apathetic and they feel like nothing can happen and their party isn't doing anything they care about, they're much more likely to stay home. And that's actually what will determine what happens in 14. Okay, thanks. And this is a follow-up to that one. How do you overcome the political and financial influence of big fossil fuel companies? Well, let me say this. We ran two propositions in 2010 and 2012 in California, and we won 70 and 60% of the vote. And I think people think that Californians are insane. <laughs> but in self-defense, they also think people from Vermont may be insane. <laughs> and I think that actually, we're very typical Americans, and I think that the lessons are the same. When we have been working anywhere in the country, in California we tried very hard and were successful in making it bipartisan, we always want to include a broad coalition of people. We never, if, if it goes, Enviros v. Business, consider yourself a loser. That is an absolute losing proposition in the United States of America. The question you have to ask is, how do you get business on your side? How do you get workers on your side? You really need a completely different coalition. So one of the things that's true that I'm sure you guys know is, if you go around the country and see who cares most about environmental issues, who votes most strongly on environmental issues, who's consistently the best, it's Latinos. We have a heavy Latino population in California. It's one of the great things about the state. If you want to know who votes second most, it's Asian Americans. Third most, African Americans. So when you think about any kind of electoral competition, it's really important that any coalition you're trying to build be inclusive. That it, it, that it goes broadly, both economically and by community. And so when we think about it, if we end up arguing for the environment against jobs and the economy, that is not the way to win the United States. That's why our mission 
includes the words to preserve American prosperity. We need to be able to say to working people, we need to say to business people, we are on your side. And that is the way that we actually will go forward as a much more inclusive coalition with as many Americans as possible. Okay. Uh, switching gears a little bit here. When we come up with alternatives to replace oil, and we will, what is going to happen to the oil industry, employees, jobs, retirement, investors, et cetera? Well, let me say this. The most innovative, skilled, professional energy companies in the world are American. We change the rules to include all of the costs so that they include all of the costs in making their investment decisions, include all of the costs in making their production decisions. I expect American energy companies will continue to lead the world in innovation and success. So when you look and see what happened when they, when they broke up Ma Bell and changed the information technology industry and deregulated it, Lo and behold, some of those companies have grown and done better. The fact of the matter is they have amazing capabilities, and I expect that they will be continue to be leaders. And actually, I think the kind of energy that I would expect, but I can't be sure about that they'll develop, will be much more job intensive. So from the point of view of jobs, I, I think it's, you know, I'm highly confident this will be a great job boom. The solar industry by itself has more workers than the coal industry and the natural gas industry combined already, and we're 1% penetrated. So what's the most exciting technology or solution to address climate change to which you've committed your money? <laughs> <laughs> you might want to break that well, one in half. <laughs> so let me talk for one second about the money part, and then I'll talk for one second second about the technology part. People, in my mind, um, somewhat insanely, thought that I was doing this in order to make money. And the idea of leaving a large investment firm that I'd started that was very profitable in order to make money seemed to me to be shockingly stupid. <laughs> but in order to make sure that no one thought that, what I, that that was what I was doing, I took any, any tech investments I had and put them in a foundation. So if they turn out to be fabulous investments, that the money can only go to the foundation or to nonprofit uses. In terms of what do I think is the most, the best investment I've made, I'd hate to say that because I, you know all the other people who I've invested in might think I was slighting them. <laughs> so let me talk a little more generically for one second about what I'm hearing, which is there is an amazing amount of excitement about new technologies. And I've heard about three new battery technologies in the last week where people really feel the ability to remove the intermittency in solar and wind is very close. So if they're right, that is a game changer in terms of how we generate and use energy in the United States. But let me say also that from my point of view, the key here is system-wide. So I am excited about the idea that we get cheap you know, efficient battery technology, storage technology. That is something that would be fantastic because it would, you know, the problem with solar is if the sun's not shining, I still want to turn the lights on. And if the wind's not blowing, I still want to turn the heat on. So storage is really important. But when I think about this much more from a systemic factor, and the, the government investments in R&D have been incredibly good through the years. So I think it's essential for the United States Business doesn't really do 20-year R&D. It does not pencil for American business to do open-ended research. That has been traditionally a government function. Don't forget, the DOD, the Department of Defense, are the people who came up with the internet. American government research has had an incredible payoff for the American economy and the American private sector. In this, it's going to be important that we do the basic research and then what comes out of it? In 1983, if you had said that the, the whole point of breaking up Mob Bell was the gamification of the web, there was no web. No one knew what gamification meant. 
What we'll do, I mean, I can guess about how the systems will change when, we, when the policies open it up, but the fact of the matter is, it'll be like that. People will invent things we never imagined and will assume that they'd always been true. So, in terms of the policies to drive that change, will it be possible to solve the climate problem without putting a price on carbon? Let me say this. There's a, that's, I would reinterpret that question the following way. Can we do this voluntarily, or do we have to make systemic change, policy change, that goes throughout the system so everybody is subject to doing different calculations when they think about investment and behavior. And don't forget, one of the points about energy is it's a total commodity. When you turn your lights on in the morning, you don't know if that energy is coming from hydro or coal or natural gas or wind or anything else. It's a total commodity and people tend to think about it much too much in terms of, I mean, pretty much exclusively as consumers in terms of cost. So I would hearken back to World War II on this. And I would re remind you that in World War II, people had victory gardens. People chose to do things on behalf of the war effort that they had never done before because they cared and they wanted to make, do everything they could, and they wanted to make a statement about where their hearts were. And that was important. But that is not why we won World War II. We won World War II because we didn't make any passenger cars in Detroit. We, did, we won World War II because we sent a whole bunch of people overseas with guns. There were a lot of people who never worked who went into factories in World War II because that's what the system demanded. The Victory Gardens were wonderful, and I don't want to be remotely disrespectful, but the fact of the matter is, this is the kind of thing where the system itself has to reflect the facts. The, the capital, I'm a total believer in the, in the private sector, but I'm also a believer that the, cap, the, the private sector optimizes outcomes. And if you don't include all of the costs, they will optimize the wrong outcome because anything that's free, they will use a lot of. Because, you know, I, as I like to say, if I could run a garbage disposal business, and my garbage disposal business was to take the, all the garbage from your yards and dump them in Peter Shumlin's yard. <laughs> I would enjoy it even more. <laughs> but, that's right, They're not, I wouldn't be paying for my cost. That's not right. You're supposed to pay for the costs in your business. And the great thing about American business is, put all the costs in and they'll figure out darn well the best way to do the garbage disposal business. And they'll come up with some new ideas for the garbage disposal business. But if you don't include the cost of dumping it in Peter Shumlin's yard, we're all gonna go dump it in Peter Shumlin's yard and pocket the difference. So that's why I say it's gotta be systemic. It has to go through society. It's not voluntary. It's the, that's what government is for. Government is not the opposite of freedom. This has been true since people were grazing their cows on the village common in the 17th century. People have to pay for the cost of doing business. That's only fair. And actually, when that happens, we do a much better job. Okay, this is going to be the last question. Uh, part of the mission of NextGen focuses on prosperity, and we'd just like to have you elaborate a little bit more about the, how you view prosperity for America and how it relates to the climate future. And that'll be the, we'll wrap it up after that. Well, that question begs a lot of questions and a lot of thought, because we're obviously at a time in American history when there's real discussion about lifting all boats in the context of our economy. You know, we've had, a, we've had growth in our economy since 1990, but we haven't had growth in median income for a couple decades. And I think that that is a real question. And when we think about what's going on, we have to ask ourselves, why is that true? And how can a society like ours, which is really dependent on each other, where we're really, there is no way for Americans to succeed without each other in my mind. And so the idea that a, some small part of America would succeed magnificently 
and no one else would succeed? Is that really a sustainable way of thinking about this country and the way that we get along? I can't really imagine that that's sustainable. So when I think about energy, I, my personal guess, and I keep saying, I don't know how this will work out, but my sense is that we're going to a much more distributed form of energy, if I were to guess. That we're gonna have a lot more people employed in it, that they should be good jobs, well-paying jobs, that are, involve people all through society. When we think about retrofitting buildings, when we think about retrofitting the grid, those are all jobs for skilled workers, but not in offices. And when I think about distributed energy, I think about much more people going back to a self-reliant uh, society than one that's dependent on a few concentrated sources of energy going out through the grid, which once again, just as Thomas, just as um, Alexander Graham Bell would have understood my parents' phone system, Thomas Edison would understand our electricity system today. And I think that if I were to guess how this is gonna work, my guess is, Lots more skilled labor in order to get us to where we want to go. Lots more distributed generation to get us to where we want to go. And lower costs over time. So that's one of the reasons I'm a real believer in this is I believe we have to do it. But I think when we do it, not only will we feel as if we rose to our generation's challenge, which we have to do, but we'll also have a fairer society and a more equitable society. Thank you.